Hi, this is Harry Vo interviewing for the Veterans History Project. Here we have a veteran um, in the in the recording uh, studio with us. Please introduce us your name, your unit, your position in the army, and what wars have you served? Well, my name is uh, Miguel Angel Velez Cruz. Um, my I served in the United States Army. When I left the Army, I was, uh, the rank was uh, Specialist 5E5, basically Sergeant. Um, I worked in, uh, as a medical, I was trained as a medical records clerk. At the beginning, uh, when I served, uh, the only war that I ever served was in, in Vietnam. I was there from 19, June 68 to June 69. And I had two different jobs as a medical records clerk in a uh, missile battalion, but then in a service battalion, I worked in uh, grave registration, which was considered a service battalion in quartermasters uh, for the first logistical command. Uh, basically, that uh, after I left Vietnam, I finished my military career in Germany. Please tell us about yourself. What are important things that we might like to know? Okay, so I was born in Puerto Rico in 1949. I was uh, raised and developed in the 1950s and 60s. And that was the, the worst part of the Cold War mentality. And Puerto Rican, as US citizens, even Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States, they gave us citizenship in order to be capable of drafting of us to the army for whatever wars. My uh, grandparents uh, were drafted for the First World War. Um, my father, my biological father, and his brothers were drafted for the Second World War. Uh, my stepfather and his brothers served in the Korean War because it, it was all based on, on age and, and the different generations in my family. So I was surrounded by a family where men uh, joined the service or didn't object to be drafted to the service because Puerto Rico was a very, very poor place to be in those days. It was basically a, a third world country within the jurisdiction of the United States. It was very poor. So joining the army and getting a check every month instead of cutting sugar cane was a way out of extreme poverty. Uh, and that it was the experience in my family. So by the time I was 16, 17, the war in Vietnam was already getting hot in 1966, 67. And I was already feeling the allure of of uh, the adventure, getting out of my hometown, a small little town in a small island, and I just wanted to leave and, and see the world, and I look at the Army as one way of doing it. Also, while I was in high school, you know, you're starting to shape your, your, your political views and things, I was exposed to the propaganda, anti-communist propaganda of the 1960s. You know, we've, they told us all the time that the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, uh, the Chinese are gonna, they, they eat babies, and the communists are, the, is the, communism is the worst thing in the world, which I am, I, I've always agreed that it's, 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 it's a horrible political system, but it created a, 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 a mentality in me that anything that the government was asking me to do in order to fight communism, it was okay. Because it was like a new crusade. You know, we were going to save the world on the other side of whatever. Uh, you never questioned what was happening, and you never questioned if the government was telling you the truth or not, because that was very important, you know, it, 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 was, it was unforgivable. Uh, your country was always right. And um, that made me not, not to wait. 
instead of being drafted, I joined, I volunteered. So in December, I, I, I talked to my mother. I, I was an only child <laughs> that, that something happened. And I wanted to fly helicopters. That was the coolest thing in the 1960s, helicopters in combat. They were, they were the latest and greatest machine. I didn't know that they were very slow, very prone to dropping from the sky, very easy to shoot down. But that they don't show you that on the, uh, on the uh, ads that they had on TV to join the Army. They show those beautiful things moving at high speed and dropping soldiers and everybody wins the war. So I wanted to be a, a helicopter pilot and I, I, I joined with the idea that I was going to be, go to a helicopter school in Fort Rucker, Alabama. But my mother had other ideas. Uh, for whatever reasons, my, my family had some political connections in Puerto Rico with the uh, uh, commissioner in Washington. We don't have a congressman. We have something called a commissioner. He doesn't vote, but he has about the same privileges of any other House member has. And he was a friend of my family, the guy that was there in time. And uh, they managed through him to keep me away from something was called combat arms. Combat arms in the army is infantry, tanks, uh, anything that is shooting, artillery, anything that that is that is shooting with something. So they kept me away from that, and heli and you know being a helicopter pilot was was considered dangerous, and being an only child and and, and all those reasons, my my mother managed to keep me away from the helicopter pilot school and suddenly I'm sent to a clerk school. And I asked, why? I had a, I had a contract. I was supposed to go to a helicopter pilot school. They say, no, 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 the, the class already started. You're gonna go later. Because in those days, in the army, you, you never got an answer for anything. You were told what to do and you did it and that's it. So, okay, well, I'll go to the clerk school. So I became, um, I started my military training in what they call basic training. It's what all soldiers do, just in case, because every soldier has to be a rifleman. You have to know how to use a rifle. And that's what they do in basic training. And uh, that was done in, first in Fort Jackson and then in Fort Gordon, Georgia. Fort Jackson is in South Carolina. Uh, from there, I went to advanced infantry training, uh, not, not infantry training, advanced individual training, and they sent me to this clerk school, and they made me a medical records clerk in uh, Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri, places that I've never been in my life, because I only lived in New York City with my parents, my stepfather and my mother, for about three or four years when I was a child, between five and maybe nine years old. And uh, that was my exposure to English. Uh, but we went, they went back to Puerto Rico, and the rest of my life I lived on the island and, and with everything in Spanish. So after uh, Fort Leonard Wood, I was received orders to go to Vietnam. And I asked, you know, when am I going to Oh, they'll probably, when, this, when the school, the next class starts of helicopter school, they'll plug you out of Vietnam and send you to uh, for Rucker. And, okay, so I went to Vietnam, and I went, by the very first unit that I went there was a missile uh, air defense unit, something called Hawk missiles. Uh, these, these systems were designed to shoot down aircraft in case North Vietnamese or Russian or Chinese aircraft would come down south, which never ever happened in our 10 years involvement in Vietnam. There was never no aircraft coming from the north to the south. We sent thousands of aircraft from the south to the north, but so our unit was there for a few years, but by the time I was there about six months to eight months in, in, in this unit, which was the, the first unit that I, I, I remember was headquarters and headquartered battery. 
because it's, it's, it's considered uh, air defense artillery, the, the missiles, the rockets. Headquarter, headquarter battery, I think it was uh, 6th Battalion, 71st Artillery, and uh, air defense. And uh, they decided to send that unit to Germany because there was no use for it in Vietnam. But anybody who was six months or less in country were going to stay in Vietnam. So what do we do with Mickey Vélez? I was the battalion aid station medical records clerk, and I assisted at the, I was learning things about uh, how to, you know, what they do in aid stations. Uh, but suddenly they sent me to a place called the 38th base post office because I was a clerk. I was not a, I was not a shooter. And that is the place where it was a huge room under a, a wooden building where they had thousands, 500,000 uh, cards printed by computers, by IBM computers. Before you guys, you never heard of these because you were not even born when they were already changed. Computers were programmed using cards. You would type code on a card, the computer would read the card like a uh, let me see what today reads something similar to that. Uh, maybe like a zip drive, but you have to imagine it's a piece of paper with a, with a bunch of holes. And it would read that information. So every single soldier, airman, and sailor in the Vietnam area had a card like that. We controlled that way uh, the movement of, it, of, their, of their mail packages sent from home, letters, and whatever. But that unit was, was there for the exclusive reason of every time that somebody was wounded, got sick, or died in combat, the unit, the parent unit, the infantry unit, or whatever, wherever he was that, got, that he got hurt or, or died, would produce a piece of paper and that piece of paper would become a, another card, another printed card. And I, I would receive one of those cards, I would receive packages every day. Because there were thousands of people getting sick or wounded in Vietnam every single day. And we were all divided in, by, by last names. And I would take, look in my files for the card of the individual that said, keep on sending the mail wherever he, wherever he is, and substitute it with one that said search. Search means like we're looking for you, but in reality means that something happened to you. And sometimes it said search K-I-A. That's the very first time in my life that I heard that acronym. Because not even in training we heard of that acronym. I saw it, at least me, I was not exposed to it, which means killed in action. And those we already knew that they were dead. So we started a process of withholding their, their mail and all the packages and making sure that it was uh, any stuff, because all that stuff was going back home, but it was there were any pornographic magazines that he might get, uh, uh, photos that his wife was not supposed to see, we took them out. Uh, there was a, a unit that just cleanse all their belongings to make sure there were no drugs, no nothing. Going back home, that would make the family feel uncomfortable because that person instantly became a hero. And we had to protect its image. So that was what was done there. Um, about, how about been five months uh, in that unit and the captain, of the unit called me and he said, that's the 38th base post office, he said, uh, Velez, we need you, or Velez Cruz, because I had both last names. That's another story why in Puerto Rico we use two last names. It has to do with the old Napoleonic code. And um, Velez Cruz, we need you for a special mission, a special assignment. I was still gonna be in 
with a 38 BPO, but I was going to go TDY, which means temporary duty. And you still belong to your unit, but you, they are lending you to a unit that needs your hands. You're going to go TDY to this unit. It's, uh, it deals with casualties and making casualty reports and dealing with casualties. And uh, so I thought it was going to be like a hospital. But I, I, I didn't know anything about grave registration, which was the, the service unit. They're called service unit that uh, also belonged to the first logistical command that took care of all services in Vietnam for, for the guys in the field. And grave registration was in reality commanded by a quartermaster battalion. Quartermaster is, is the, the, the people that move things in the army. Uh, boxes of bullets, boxes of food, boxes of clothing, and boxes of people. When, when people died in the service, they are not patients anymore, and they're treated, uh, I don't know, I'd say like a, like, like, like a commodity, like a thing, and they're moved around, I think, with respect. We were always very concerned about those, we called them men, but they were all boys, I was 18, I wanted to be called a man, not a boy. But now that I'm 71, I see them as children because they were 18, 19, most of them. And um, they moved them around as things, okay? We use forklifts because sometimes we have to put 10, 20, 50 in an aircraft because it was wholesale slaughter. In Vietnam, there were weeks or months where there was a lot of activity happening, a lot of combat, or a lot of attacks, or a lot of issues why people would die. There were, I knew people who commit suicide. I knew people who would, uh, were so terrified of going to the field, draftees, that in, for some crazy reason, they would harm themselves, and sometimes they would die, which is illogical because you're afraid of going to the field because you're afraid of being hurt, but then you hurt yourself with a rifle or a grenade, and you end up dead. So we, we receive all kinds, we, all, all kinds of people, even, civil, even civilians, nurses, doctors, people who died in accidents. There were traffic accidents. Uh, people who were shot down in helicopters, so we, 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 got, we had to process all kinds of, of individuals that were exposed to harm. And the first week that I was there, it was scary. I have seen bodies before. I, in, in Puerto Rico in those days, funerals would happen in the house. If somebody, one of my uncles, great uncles died, or grandpa, whatever, the viewing, because there were Catholics, would happen in the house where that person lived. And he was usually, an, an older person would usually live with, with his son or daughter. So it would happen in the house that they lived. When my grandmother died, she was viewed in her living room. So I was used to seeing dead bodies, because they took me to, a, by the way, in the, in the Catholic tradition, Hispanic Catholic tradition, they don't keep you away from, from funerals. They, they want you to see to be exposed to that because probably it's, it's, it's a part of life. So I, I had seen bodies, but never I had seen somebody exposed to a, what I call a traumatic event, like a traumatic amputation, when something is blown up away from you, an arm, a leg, a head, and we had to deal with that. So when I saw the first nasty ones, I was apprehensive, you know, you know, doing my job, but mm. but then after a couple of weeks, your brain becomes like you have some kind of processing system that allows you to get used to it. Somehow you protect yourself, not going crazy of seeing such horror, 
And I kept doing my job. I never, I was not an embalmer, I was not, you know, but I did have to help because the guys, the people who actually did, did work on the bodies were overwhelmed. They were, we worked seven days a week. They just had enough crews to give us a break and actually they sent me there so people could take a break, especially with the paperwork. Because we gotta make sure that we send the body to the right place. So we had to identify them properly. And what I did is I made sure that, when, you know, we took all the clothes off, everything, socks, socks, shoes, everything. And in the Army, they teach you your belt, your pants, your shirt, your boots, every piece of uniform, your hats, every piece of uniform they give you, you write your name, rank, and serial number. So we would look at these things because the dog tags, Sometimes they were there and sometimes they were not. A lot of guys threw them away in the field because they were afraid of the noise they make. They dingle. And if you want to be quiet at night and you're moving in the middle of, of an operation, they would throw away their dog tags or put them in a pocket and then if something happens, the dog tags were lost. But the medic in the unit would tie a usually in, 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 a, in a hand or in a thumb or in a foot, a, a tag explaining that this is so-and-so, but I have to confirm that this is so-and-so, so I start all the paperwork that's required to fill as a casualty report. And the morticians sometimes would take fingerprints. Uh, most of the time they did, unless it was very clear they had the, their wallet with them, and I saw the uh, ID card, the, and it was very easy. Eh, we, we said, he, he's him. And it was clear, no, no, no facial injuries, and the guy was not badly de decomposed. So, but most of the time, we got people that didn't look nice. Their faces were contorted or wounded, or they were a wound, a, a, a bullet hits you in the face, it makes a mess of it. Your bone structure gets all messed up. If it's, if it's an explosive, it's even worse. So we, we did uh, fingerprinting, and I saw things that were crazy. Um, there was a pilot, a helicopter pilot that was burned, so we couldn't see anything. So the skin was coming off of his hands, so one of the guys, so the morticians, took the skin of the fingers off and put it in his own hand so he could take the finger, do the fingerprints. So imagine that. And, I, and you see that, and you say, that's horrible. But when you start seeing things like that every day, you start saying, well, that's it. That's how it is. And that was my experience in Vietnam until June 69. I spent there like five months, every single day, seeing dead people and helping ship them home. Uh, they sent me back to the United States because I still had over a year left in the Army. Went back home for my, my leave. Every time you left Vietnam, they would give you 30-day leave. I decided to get married with my girlfriend, we got married. And uh, when I went back to Texas, which was for some reason, they sent me back to the, that uh, 71st Artillery Unit, the Air Defense Unit in Fort Bliss, uh, probably because it was in my record. And when I arrived there, they told me, you're, going, you're leaving for Germany. So they sent me to Germany with my wife and I ended my military career in Stuttgart, living in Stuttgart, in, uh, in, uh, as a paymaster, paying the troops, because I was a clerk. I was, not a, I was not an airborne ranger or anything like that. And I left the Army, immediately I left the Army with a GI Bill. I joined the University of Puerto Rico and I wanted to study medicine, and my family was poor. I couldn't go to med school, but I managed to get a degree in biochemistry, two, two majors, and 
I was a pretty good student, did pretty well, and uh, right after college, I got a job in the pharmaceutical industry. First in a company that was making devices, and then in, a, in, in, a, in Johnson & Johnson, worked 27 years for them. That was my, my, my major job, I worked for the same company, making all kinds of drugs. Uh, prescription drugs, over-the-counter drugs, different divisions. And I did all kinds of jobs. Even an engineering job, you know, I'm not an engineer, but they made me an engineer, engineer probably because they, 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 they like it. And I had a very good career, very busy career, very, very busy career, and joyful. They gave me all the toys that I wanted every time there was a new project. And so my, my memory of the war during those days was basically, uh, if somebody asked, you, you, were you Vietnam vet? I would say, yes, sure. What did you do? Oh, I was a clerk. Uh, but I never talked to anybody about my experience in Vietnam. They were very good memories of Vietnam. Because remember, we, they would give us a break once in a while, and I would go to Saigon. I was in Saigon. I would go around downtown. I remember that I used to visit a lot, go to the same place always. The, um, the, uh, they had a nice uh, zoo on the outskirts of Saigon. And my favorite place to go, because I did it as much as I could, was there is an area at the outskirts of Saigon, like, a, like suburbia, we would call it today, which is called Cholong. That was the Chinese, um, the Chinese barrio, the Chinese neighborhood of all Chinese refugees that came from, from the nationalist uh, uh, groups in, in China. They went first to North Vietnam, and then when North Vietnam was taken by the communists, they moved to Saigon. So Cholong was the Chinese neighborhood, and they had the very best restaurants. And I was always looking at the girls, of course, like any other 18, 19 year old girl, boy would do. I was trying to keep myself for for my, and I have to confess, I was always trying to keep myself for my, 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 my girlfriend, because I, I was terrified of getting sick or anything like that. I worked in a medical unit, so I knew what venereal diseases were. But I always found Vietnamese girls so delicate and so beautiful, very thin. The, I forgot the name of the, the dresses that they use. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. uh, exactly. Bao Dai, and, and I found that so elegant and so beautiful because uh, the, the Vietnamese, men and females, uh, men and, 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 yeah, and females, they're very thin. They're usually uh, very thin and, and elongated people. They're, even their faces are. And I, I found them attractive. And I found their culture interesting because I was, I was interested in them. What am I doing here? So I, I, I needed to learn about them. And I found Saigon a, a, a very beautiful uh, quasi-French town. Uh, great bars and good music. That's when I first got introduced to rock because I came from Puerto Rico and in 1968 it was not a big thing on the island. The music that we heard there was different. But uh, so those were the positive memories that I had of Vietnam. Those were the ones that I talked most. I never mentioned to my wife or my family, and I had uh, five children. Uh, I never ever mentioned them about my experience, the nasty part of the war, the things that I saw, and the things that I had to do. So I lived my life. Forgot about it until I retired when I was 60 years old. I had a heart attack because of other conditions. I was exposed to a lot of junk, like a lot of almost everybody did in Vietnam, hanging orange and all that stuff. One of the components is dioxin, which is a horrible poison. And uh, so they think it affected my heart because when I was in my 30s, I started having problems with my heart. And uh, I retired when I got my heart attack. My wife said, no, you work enough. I had done pretty well in the, in the industry. 
and I already had a, so I, by 62, I could have taken my, my, my pension as the fullest. But why, why stay longer? Yeah, Catherine and my wife said, you should retire, and she's younger than me. She, I'll work until I can retire. And we already had the kids, part of the kids in college, the first three, and uh, it was, everything was okay. Now I find with nothing else to do, because I didn't want it to work, I didn't want it to consult, friends came to my house, hey Mickey, let's do some consulting, we'll make a lot of money, I say, I have the money I need, and I was not ambitious in that sense, and I started trying to do some arts and crafts, took painting, took uh, writing, uh, making little airplanes and little uh, uh, cannons and things from, 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 from kits. So I became basically a, uh, involved in, in, in the artsy part of my brain that I have never developed because I was a techie. And especially with the painting, I really got hooked into that. And drawing because I could never even draw a circle. So I took classes, uh, night classes that I took for, for drawing and then for, for, color, for oil painting. And I've been doing that for the last uh, seven, eight years. But when I was about 65, 65 I started having these uh, memories of the war, nightmares. They first started at dreams and then at nightmares. The typical nightmare was in my room. I'm sitting. I have a little sitting area in, in, in our master bedroom. And uh, somebody comes through the door of my bedroom and it's five, six, seven, eight kids. Some of them have uniforms, torn uniforms. Some of them have uh, hospital gowns. Just how I receive them in the mortuary. And they start talking to me. I cannot remember a single name, but I remember the faces. I remember the faces like it was yesterday, and I still remember the faces. And they're talking to me, hey Mickey, because everybody calls me Mickey, the, the, my friends. In the, in, in the army also, everybody knew that I was Mickey, because that's the nickname that my mother gave me. And hey Mickey, why don't you come with us? Come with us. And I interpret that is that I knew, I knew because those were the guys that were dead that I processed. I knew that they were on the other side of the fence. <laughs> and uh, I thought that they were calling me to be with them. And I started getting scared. I say, am I going to do something to myself to go with those guys? Because they're inviting me to go and play ball with them. You know, let's play ball, let's do something to, together. And it got really, really scary. And I couldn't sleep because I was terrified of closing my eyes. Because if I went to sleep, they would come. So I, become, I was becoming uh, depressed and horrendously tired all the time and I couldn't do anything. So my, I went to my doctor and he told me, I think you might have PTSD. I said, but how come? It's 50 years since the war. I said, well, we're discovering that your brain keeps that stuff hidden because you're busy while you're living a life. And you, it protects yourself like that. Now that you're retired, your brain is not as busy as it used to be. Those file cabinets start opening and, you, and, and they start, you start remembering things. And as a grandfather, the, the, the value that I have for life and for harm to young men is very different than I had when I was there. We were all airborne chairs, you know, we, they used to call us chairborne rangers. Uh, but we all wanted to be looked as men, rough, tough guys, even though we were all boys. Uh, but that's not how I saw myself then, that's how I see then now. When I see those bodies, I see boys. I don't see men, I see children. And it got really, really bad. So this physician 
recommended that I started uh, doing psychotherapy and a psychiatrist, then they sent me, my, psych, my, psych, my private psych, psych, psychologist sent me to the VA uh, and they diagnosed me at the VA, again, confirmed that I have suffered from post-traumatic stress, stress uh, syndrome, I think it's called, and I've been in treatment for the last four or five years at the VA Hospital here in Philadelphia in their program for PTSD. I've been told that that is forever. You cannot cure a memory. The horrors that I saw of dismembered bodies, beautiful people destroyed, Vietnamese and Americans, will never you can not unforget something like that. That's, that's why it's called a trauma. So what I do is, every two to three weeks, I talk to a psychologist, and I keep an eye on myself uh, using different techniques that they show me on how to deal with that, how to accept it, how to embrace it, embrace those memories as, as part of my service. Uh, there is, you know, some things that I, that I don't want to remember, but they will always be there. There are some things of the service of the Army that I loved. I loved the camaraderie. I, I would have, if it wasn't because I, I, I went to college and I studied uh, science, I would have stayed in the Army. Because it was, it was to me, it was a nice, it was a nice career. It was a good thing to do. It was, it was something noble. It was like being a priest, like being a teacher, being a soldier was something noble. That was in my brain, in my mind. Because you did something that nobody else wanted to do, but somebody had to do it. But uh, thank God, you know. I, I didn't stay because I would have gone again to Vietnam and who knows what would have happened. I would have might end up in that stupid helicopter school and I might end up being dead. You don't know what life does, keeps for you. But after that I had a decent life and all the only negative things about uh, that is uh, the memories of, the, of, of those five months. So, I guess the next question would be, what does war mean to you now? Well, like I told you, I was raised as I was, my brain was being formed as a teenager during the Cold War. And this anti-communist propaganda was pouring in high school, on TV, all the time. Oh, the communists are gonna kill us all, the nuclear weapons everywhere. So I became a believer. I was brought up as a believer in this anti-communism doctrine that we had in the 1960s, 50s and 60s. I always believed that every word that came from my government was the truth. My government would never ever lie, especially a president or a Congress. These were our leaders. These were decent people that we elected to, to take care of us. After the Vietnam War, after the fall of Saigon 75, uh, a lot of books started coming out. Uh, I started reading about the origins of the conflict in, in Southeast Asia, including the, the French Indochina Wars, um, Street Without Joy, uh, Bright Shining Lie, all the novels that came out, uh, and the, in the history book, the Pentagon Papers that came out, even but but, but, but the thing was still going on at the, in the latter part, in the 1970s. Uh, things, information start coming out that our government knew that we could never ever win that conflict. The objectives that the United States government had, had uh, tried to achieve in Vietnam were unachievable, okay? And 
they knew that early. By, some people say that by 1965. And most of the people that died, of Americans that died in Vietnam, died in 1968, 69, and the 70s. The, the tens of thousands. And even though, you know, Richard Nixon knew, and Lyndon Johnson actually decided not to even run for president because he knew that he had made a mistake, they kept sending, they kept sending people there. And they kept blowing up the place up. Okay, it's, it's not only the people that we lost. You can't imagine killing in such a short period of time over, they think that it's between one and three million people died in Southeast Asia because of our intervention there, because we bombed the place to, to hell. We would use, somebody would shoot the, a round and we would call in artillery and blow up the whole, blow up a whole mountain. So because we had that power. So a lot of civilians, not only North Vietnamese and Viet Cong combatants were killed, but a lot of civilians died. And, and I lost, by the 19, end of the decade of the 1970s, I had lost all confidence in my government. I never thought that the government would ever be truthful again. I don't believe that anything that comes from Washington is the truth. I lost faith. I do not lose faith in my country because I don't think that Washington is my country. I am one of those believers of we the people. And you are we the people. I am one of those we the people. And uh, so I, I still believe in my country, but I don't trust any leader of any country of any part of the world because I think they lie. Politicians have a tendency to believe more in themselves than in their own people. And they, they can send young boys to do lots of harm in places, not because the United States is in danger, but because their next political election might be in danger. And they can send young boys to get hurt and hurt themselves. And because we are so powerful, we hurt other people more than we get hurt ourselves by the thousands, by a factor of an exponential factor. So that's, that's, that's my wound, the loss of that innocence, the loss of that belief in, in, in the people in Washington. I just, I lost a lot. Is this something that you would go back in time and tell your 19-year-old self? I, in, in, in 2000, there was the Gulf War. My oldest son, Michael, he's Miguel Angel también, he was of age, and they were talking, oh my God, we're gonna have to put 500,000 people in, in, in the Middle East, you know, the, the first Gulf War. And uh, uh, I, thought, I think they might start drafting because we don't have enough people in the Army for that. Because they took every National Guard unit, they took every reserve unit. And I thought, oof, if they start drafting, I'm gonna send my boy to Spain. I have relatives and friends in Spain because my ancestry is Spanish. And I told my wife, he will get on a plane, and I don't care how many, too much money I have to pay lawyers, but he's not going to, to any military service for what I thought, because I, now I started digging what politicians are doing that we have to go to the Gulf War, you know, to protect oil interests. And I, and I, and I, and I, and I question every single military action that the U.S. government gets involved with. I always question it now. And that's one of the lessons of that, of that experience. So would you say that this, this uh, part that you had in the war, do you, do you let it define you or you, you move on from that? It, it, it never goes away, so it, it, it does define you. Every, every experience that you have, I'm talking now as a 72-year-old guy, okay? Every experience that you have in life will define you. 
War or no war? Peace or no, or, 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 it doesn't matter. Every experience you have in life will define you. That made a big imprint because it was very traumatic. So it left a very big imprint in life. For example, I always wanted to work, why I always wanted to work in the healthcare industry. I always wanted to, I wanted to be a physician. I couldn't because you needed a lot of money to go to medical school and I come from a poor family. So the next best thing, when I got an opportunity, I stayed and, and always enjoyed working in the healthcare industry in medical devices. I, I, I was working in the development of kidney coils, you know, for dialysis, uh, IV sets and stuff like that. And then in drugs that were helping people. So that defined me. That, when I saw so many people hurt, they said, I would like to do something better than hurt people or make money. So it, it made me, even though uh, I'm pretty smart, I could have been a banker or a, a salesman in, in, one, in a corporate system and probably make millions, I said, I'll make enough to raise a family. Uh, and I did pretty well, but uh, I wanted to always be in a place where I could help. And uh, I love the Army because of the sacrifice those boys make. Those men make a sacrifice for all of us. And I, and I, and I love them, and I, and I always hope the best for them because they do things to protect us. They're there for us to be protected. Every country needs an Army, unfortunately, in this modern world. But, uh, but I keep an eye on what the government uses those resources that they have because sometimes they might be used for, it's, it, it's needed to get them involved, but sometimes it's just for political bull. And uh, I'm very concerned on how that precious resource is used. And that's, that, that could be a, a, a lesson learned of my experience. In your journey defining defining your PTSD with your um, psychologist, are there any important pieces or particular pieces that you would like to share with us? Sharing? I never ever told anybody about the bad things that I saw. I should have started talking about that when I was younger. It doesn't mean that it would have gone away or maybe that PTSD might have manifested in, a, might, might manifest it in a different way because I'm not an expert in that field. I don't know, but they tell me, and when I spend time with other uh, veterans that, uh, uh, that take the same uh, therapies that I take in, in, in the VA hospital here, uh, the, the sharing of the experience, the talking about it, uh, saying what you want to say about how you feel about it. Uh, there's a group here in, 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 in the VA that uh, uses a concept called the modern moral injury process. And that moral injury process, um, first it parts from the premise that war is bad. Most People believe that even though men have been doing it for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, who've been uh, depredating each other, you know, killing, doing harm to each other, to take the woman, to take the land, the men's before, even though they were they were women warriors for for ages, but it mostly been a, a men thing. Uh, they say that our brain is not designed to be exposed to that kind of stuff. We don't like it. it it's not good for you. It's not good for your mental health. It wasn't good 2,000 years ago when you read about the Homeric tales of the Iliad, the Odyssey. You feel the same stories that modern soldiers with PTSD tell you come from those stories in the past. And those are thousands of years old. So it looks like, 
soldiers were condemned to that horrible nightmare of watching or seeing or doing things to other human beings that are not good for you, that are not good for your mental health, and you will suffer for it. So it, 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 the, the, the latest uh, the data says that it, it's not good. Any kind of trauma that you see of harm to be done from one human being to another, it's not good for your mental health. You're not designed for that. And uh, that is something that, through the moral injury group, I learned, and that I have the right to demand from my government when they're going to send young men to combat for whatever interest, to protect our country, whatever interests they are. And I have the right to demand of all the United States citizens to be involved in that process. In other words, we, with the war in Afghanistan and, 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 and Iraq, nobody cares, nobody knows. And everybody says, oh, they remember on last weekend, oh yes, um, there's a bunch of soldiers on place doing some things, but they're not really involved. It doesn't touch them because we have a volunteer army now. Nobody joins. You know, very few people join. Less than a fraction of 1% are the families in America that are in board, that are paying the price for the protection of all our interests. That is not right in my perspective because it, 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 we're harming all those boys by exposing them to those horrors because when they come back, I'm telling you, they're not supposed to be seeing people blown up, babies being blown up. Little children die of, of sometimes of your own, your own weapons because you don't know, some, in the middle of a mess, all kinds of stuff happens. And then when you come up, you come up with that baggage and nobody cares. Well. Through the moral injury process, I learned that everybody should care. It is our responsibility. It's not that we have to do it because we're supposed to be nice. No, it is our responsibility to care where we send those boys, what they're doing, because they're doing it for us. They're not doing it for themselves. They're doing it for us. And it's our responsibility of what they do. So when they come back, it's our responsibility to make sure that they have all the tools to process all that mess that's in their brain. And uh, that's another lesson to learn. Uh, Do you have any concluding uh, pieces of... Uh, I, I am a Puerto Rican. And uh, with a Latin background, Latin, you know, Latin, from Latin America, so I'm... I'm a romantic at heart, even though I'm a techie. So once in a while when I want to say something to myself or, or to my wife or to my children, I say it in writing and sometimes I say it in verse. So I wrote something because I can never remember their names. I can only remember their faces. I wrote something for these kids that visit me at night. Old nights of soft, pale armor. Why are you so still and quiet? Do you come to me for companionship? Do you want me to play on your game? Your game is past. Stay on your side of the field. I fear your countenance. The way you stand reminds me of my resolute pose. I am fearful 
go to your house of fire. I want to touch you. I want to clean your wounds. Will you forgive my fear? Please stay on your side of the field. Your face is familiar, but all your faces were the same. Young, soft, pale, like children with no sun. Please stay on your side. I won't forget you. Thank you, Mickey. Thank the all the time we have. I, I want to thank you for participating in the Veterans History Project. It's really important that we capture your story and we have it just somewhere for future reference. And I'm sorry I got a little bit emotional there at the end. You're good. No, it's perfect. Because it, uh, they were kids and we were all kids. It, it's important, Mickey. It's important. It's very important. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay.